heart disease is the leading cause of death in African American and white women in the United States. More than 7% of all African American women have coronary disease, but many do not know it because they have no symptoms. The good news is that there are lifestyle changes we all can make to prevent heart disease. Up next on Another View, Gail Alexander Wright shares her story of surviving a heart attack, and cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby tells us what we must all do to be healthy. I'm Barbara Ham Lee, and it's Another View on Health. But first, it's Pledge Express. Time to support WHRV and Another View. Here's Sandra Woodward and Dan Cauley with an update on how we're doing. All right. Thank you, Barbara, and good afternoon. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African American community. This is Another View. And good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee and all those people are cheering because they've already made their pledge of support for Another View. So even though we're on the air and we're going to be talking about a really serious conversation today, but a, but a conversation that will help you have a healthier lifestyle. But while we're on the air, you can still call in and make your pledge of support. So 889-9476 or 1-800-940-7177. Zero are the numbers to call if you want to pledge in support of Another View. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in today's show. Before we get to Dr. Newby and um, Gail Alexander-Wright um, and talk about heart disease, I also want to remind you excuse me, that um, the Team Up Scrabble for Literacy Tournament will be here at WHRO on Friday, March 1st. That's next Friday. And this is for student and adult Scrabble players and word lovers of all stripes. Um, this is the seventh year that we've done this, and it is hosted by the Literacy Partnership and WHRO. It starts at 5.30 p.m. And if you need more information, you can dial 773-7550. So, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, poor diet, excessive use of alcohol, obesity, smoking. These are all factors that could lead to heart disease. Heart disease is the leading, leading cause of death among women, yet 64% of women who die suddenly of coronary disease have no previous symptoms. Each month, we talk with cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby about health issues and the impact on people of color. And since this is February, we're focusing on heart disease in African-American women. Welcome, Dr. Newby. Thank you very much. So good to see you. You as well. And also joining us is Ms. Gail Alexander-Wright, who at age 39, am I correct in that, or 37? 37. 37. 37, had a heart attack and then a stroke after that. So she's here to share her story. Gail, welcome to another view. Thank you. And I think we're exposing you to a new show, aren't we? Yes, you are. That's fantastic. Yeah. Hopefully you'll become an avid listener. We appreciate that. So <clears throat> before we get into the nuts and bolts of exactly what heart disease is and so forth. Gail, why don't you tell us a little bit about what was going on in your life at 37 and what happened to you? Um, my personal story is, um, I guess, one of many women. You'll, you'll hear it time and time again. Being a mother and a wife, um, I was very, um, very stressed out trying to juggle, you know, mom, wife, full-time job. I was also an active drilling reservist with the United States Navy. Wow. And I also decided at that time that I wanted to be a, a, a cake uh, baker. So I had a little small home-based business going on, not knowing that all of that was very stressful on my body. Mm -hmm. And how was your diet and, and all of that? I mean, were you sleeping? Were you eating properly? Diet, um, now that I know what I know, um, I thought it was, you know, very good, but I'm learning uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I will be honest, though, and say I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. So average four hours a night, maybe. Wow. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> now, when you had your heart attack, you actually had just finished exercising. Yes, I did. And usually when people say, you know, you're exercising, that's a good thing. What what happened to you? Um, with the heart attack, I do remember... Um, as most women, you know, we gain a few pounds and, you know, even though I was already an avid runner, I wanted to take my work up, workout up a notch. So that particular night I did a Billy Banks boot camp tape <laughs> and I, I had done it, you know, years prior. So, but that particular night I remember afterwards, I felt really fatigued. 
to the point where um, even after I showered, I, I just wanted to lie down. And that wasn't normal for me. Mm -hmm. Did it did it trigger in your mind that it had something to do with your heart? No, it did not. So it what really made didn't. you go get? Um, get what help? happened was um, after I worked out, it was around 630 in the evening and I went downstairs to eat dinner sat down to eat my dinner and that's when I felt a pressure in my chest. It wasn't necessarily a, a pain, but it felt like some pressure, something was holding uh, my chest back. So did it feel like something mm -hmm. was sitting on you? It maybe? sure did. It okay. sure did. Okay. And I was sitting there eating dinner and then I remember telling my daughter, she was 14 at the time, that I was going to go upstairs and lie down. Remember going up the stairs and every step that I went up to get, usually I could just zip upstairs. Mm -hmm. It was like pulling a mountain just to walk upstairs. So mm -hmm. progressively it got the fatigue really got progressively worse rather quickly. Mm -hmm. Went upstairs, took two prescription strength, and I know I'm not supposed to do that, Dr. Newby. It <laughs> wasn't prescribed to me, but <laughs> I'm finding out that that was probably a good idea because I took the Motrin before I went, lay, before I went before to lie went down. down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, told my daughter to wake me up in an hour, and she woke me up, and that's when I had all of the warning, classic warning signs for a heart attack. The sweating, the everything. nausea, everything. Nausea, everything. The whole bit. Mm -hmm. So what did they discover was it, was it a blocked artery? It was what a was blood it? clot. A blood clot. Uh, in my situation, it was a blood clot. And um, was rushed. My, my daughter had to call 911, was rushed to the ER. And at that time, um, that's when I was diagnosed as having a heart attack and was rushed back to the catheterization lab. And that's where they did the research and saw that I had a, a, mm -hmm. a blood clot. Dr. Newby, is her story typical of what women do? They, they feel this pressure or they... They feel a little nauseous or whatever, and they ignore yeah, what's he, going on. It's actually somewhat variable. You can have some that, you know, she actually had classic symptoms. Um, most people, especially women, don't have those classic symptoms. They may feel just the fatigue she described initially mm -hmm. without the chest discomfort. I've had some that don't get short of breath. They don't get the nausea or sweatiness. I've had some that the only thing they get is jaw pain. You know, because mm. of, and all that's just reflective of nerves that are supplying the heart where they're actually radiating to. And you, and, and it's kind of a variable. That's why they're so, we're, we're at least I know me personally, I'm very astute when it comes down to women uh, and symptoms or lack thereof in terms of do I really think this is going to be heart related or not. You always take into account that they don't have the same classic symptoms mm -hmm. as what you'll see in the textbooks and more than not you won't they'll just have fatigue or some other issue but they know something's not right so why is it different between men and women because you know we're all used to the classic you know grab your chest you know that men fall down you know that kind of thing why yeah. is it different for they women? don't have a single <laughs> solitary clue <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you you know it, it could be a reflection of how nerves are distributed i mean it's it's, it's hard to say, you know, I, I tell you what, what I have found, um, you know, and I'll just tell a little quick story. When I was first came back to the area, I don't want to tell my age, but when I first came back to the area in 97, um, you know, I was working in Hampton with a group over there at that time. And I remember telling my wife about this very sad story. I was on a call one night and I had this young lady. She had just had a baby. I mean, not even two weeks prior to it, and mm -hmm. been to the ER several times with chest discomfort. And of course, she was only 25 years old. So uh, they, nobody thought. Because hard. they don't assume yeah, because, that when yeah, you're that it, young, exactly. that there's an issue. And uh, she really had gotten put off, not so much if, uh, for anybody's fault, but just, it was just the age didn't match what you normally would see. Needless to say, she happened to come back to the emergency room one night. I was on call in the ER doc. I said, listen, man, this, this young lady just came here. She'd been to three different ERs. And they keep blowing her off. And he said, just take a look at it because uh, something's not right. And when I went down there, I said, well, let's get an EKG. I and mean, it's just classic, you know, tombstone elevated uh, EKG suggestive mm. of a uh, heart attack. But the problem was she'd had a heart attack about a week ago. So this was mm. the residual continuing. And uh, the sad part about it was her heart was already damaged to the point of, of um, it couldn't be repaired. Okay. And she died that night. And she oh, just, wow. she was 24, 25 years old, had just had this child a couple of weeks prior to. And uh, that just broke my heart that night to, to, to deal with that. I mean, because, you know, it's just, I mean, that's not, now that's not classic. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's rare that mm -hmm. you would see somebody that young 
having that, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened was there was more blood clot than it was, you know, and that's what really happens with a heart attack anyway. It's not. I was going to ask you, what exactly is the definition of a heart attack? When people talk about heart attacks, and they'll use heart attacks and cardiac arrest interchangeably, and they're really not the same thing. Cardiac Mm -hmm. arrest is straight when you have a heart rhythm disturbance. It's not compatible with life. Now, it can be as a result of a heart attack. What a heart attack is, is a, a complete obstruction of blood flow to an area of the heart. You use three major arteries. You, know, you have the front wall, it was called the anterior descending, back wall called the circumflex vessel, and the mm-hmm. right coronary artery which supplies the bottom wall of the heart. And what happens is, you know, typically you will get plaque formation, like a cholesterol plaque. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that it's not so much, you don't get these, a lot of people will get the impression, they think it's like a, some 99% blockage that all of a sudden closes off. And that's not typically what happens. You'll get a 20%, 30% blockage that has soft plaques so the actual plaque formation is very soft and it tends to erode up into the vessel when it erodes up it gets released into the bloodstream and the bloodstream looks at it just like if you cut yourself and you see you know the blood starts coming out the mm-hmm. body's clot mechanisms start because it has to close off that area but inside a vessel blood's got nowhere to go so if you start developing clot and it starts to build once it clues the vessel uh-huh. that's when a heart attack occurs because it's obstructing totally that blood flow going to that area of the heart mm-hmm. so that's really what a heart attack is it's a total complete obstruction of blood flow that's typically from clot on top of a soft plot so what is angina well angina is when you have symptoms of chest discomfort that that could be either um what they call classic um, stable angina or mm-hmm. uh, aggressive or progressive angina. Uh, stable angina means, let's say, if I get out and walk, if I walk, say, if I'm, like, say, I'm, you, you're now joking about where I'm, I just hail from. Now, I live <laughs> down the street. Mm-hmm. So, say I'm walking three blocks to the house, and uh, at block one, I start noticing some chest discomfort. I stop and it goes away. Every time I walk that block, I start getting that discomfort. I stop, it goes away. That's That's angina. Or angina. Okay. That's mm-hmm. that's uh, you do have obstruction of blood flow, but it's not complete obstruction. So, when you're walking, you know, the heart works on a supply demand basis. You know, when you walk a certain distance, you know, you're, you require a certain amount of blood flow to those muscles that are making you walk. Mm-hmm. So you need that certain amount of blood flow. If the heart cannot get it, if the heart's saying, "Okay, I got to pump out like five liters of blood," you know, per minute. But when I'm walking, I need to do eight. But at seven. You know, the blood flow to the heart, I, I can't get enough blood flow to the heart in order to pump to out that blood out. to that mm-hmm. area. Then you start, something starts breaking down. And that's when you start getting those classic symptoms. Then when you stop, it goes away. So it's all a supply demand basis. So mm-hmm. angina is just when you have a partial obstruction, it's mm-hmm. not complete. So you walk a certain distance, it comes in, you stop, it goes away. Gail, when you, after you, um, were in the emergency room after they did what they needed to do to clear the clot and so forth. What was the recovery like and how did that make you start to change your lifestyle? Or was, did it? <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the For me, in my opinion, the, the recovery was, um, to me, rather lengthy because I wasn't used to being in the hospital. So I did have a ICU day, stay for a few days. And then after that... Um, I had a regular hospital stay and then I went and did cardiac rehab, which was very educational and um, allowed me to learn about um, heart disease and prevention, you know, things that I need to change my diet. Did it Um, make you afraid to 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 walk? Yes. To start to exercise? How did you get past that? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I was terrified because right after the heart attack and cardiac rehab, part of it is also getting you back to trying to exercise. So where I could run maybe an eight minute mile prior to the heart attack just to get on the treadmill uh, three weeks afterwards in cardiac rehab and walk on a treadmill at 1.5, which probably is like a 15 minute mile. (laughs) Uh, My heart would start to, you know, you'd be hooked up to some uh, uh, equipment that would Mm -hmm. monitor your heart rate and it would just spaz out. So that, of course, made me nervous. But after about, I did 12 weeks of cardiac rehab and um, was given a clean bill of health to start back working out. I was terrified and it took my cardiologist at the time to really uh, coax me into trying to get back into exercising. It was a fear. And I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. I know people are going to go, <gasps> but what about in terms of, of your love life with your husband? I mean, was that something oh, that was from a woman's thing? <laughs> ah, see? Because, yeah, because you were too nervous. About to give we him a heart were, attack. We both right, were I was nervous. Say, yeah. You both were nervous. It was very, yes. Wow. <laughs> 
So how do you work through that? I mean, I'm trying to give women a sense e- of why it is so important that they really pay attention. Eventually, to you, <laughs> you, you calm down. You calm down. <laughs> I, and I have to be honest, after about month six, I realized that I needed to get back on with my life. And um, and it does take educating from our med- medical professionals to explain to us what causes a heart attack. You know, I'm thinking if I run again, am I going to have a heart attack? Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. it took the education and um, also just trying to just decide, you know, I can't let this dictate my life, although I need to be aware, mm-hmm. but not to just completely shut down and become a hermit. <laughs> Dr. Newby, how much training do... Um, um, general practitioners, internists have in terms of recognizing that there's a, a heart issue. In other words, I, you know, as, as a lay person, you might just say, well, okay, I felt that pain in my jaw. Or I felt that pressure on my chest, but it's probably nothing. But if you go to your regular doctor, regular in quotes, will they recognize that that's what's going on? I think most most do uh, at least have some idea that something's going on. I mean, it's just like I look at it as, you know, we all have our areas of expertise. Mm-hmm. You know, heart's my thing. I mean, if I... To be honest with you, if I had a pregnant woman coming to my office telling me they about to deliver, I'm like looking like, hey, what you want me to do with you? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, you, you're used to doing dealing with certain things. And I think a lot of docs, I can recognize where the issues are. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes down to heart stuff, I mean, that's that's like my thing. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm very astute to, to get and drill into the details. I think most most primary care docs, you know, I think most people when it comes down to heart things are nervous. So they're going to go over, uh, you know, to try to make sure a person is taken care of. But Mm -hmm. the thing is, when you drill down to details, that's my job. Okay, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. Give us a call. Um, Have you experienced a heart attack or or have heart disease and how are you dealing with it? 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So, Gail, you work your way back. you, You get over the heart attack. And then you have a stroke. Yeah. I do want to interject because when Dr. Newby was talking about the early warning signs, sure. I'll be honest, as women, most of the people, you know, it's been six years now that I've spoke with, we get early warning signs. I had early warning signs and I ignored them. Three weeks before my heart attack, I had pain in, my, in the left side of my neck and it was three weeks on and off. And I thought I had a crook in my neck. I thought I needed to buy new pillows. Mm-hmm. So I do agree that. We just don't know what it. We just don't know what it is Mm -hmm. until it gets to the point where now you're having chest pain. But but in your defense, though, I mean, you know, (laughs) at 37, I mean, let's be real. I mean, there's not a lot of 37 year old women that do have heart attacks. I mean, we see it. I mean, don't misunderstand. But I mean, most of us, like I'm, you know, and I hate to say it, but you know, I'm turning 50 in a couple of months. And and, and I tell you, welcome welcome to the club. (laughs) You'll enjoy it being over. Trust me. Well, you know, but you know, the older I get the more paranoid you start to get about things that you have to look out for yourself because I mean you know you don't ever think that you're going to get old I mean you know you look at where your parents were when you were young and you just you may look at them as being older at the time but when you're growing up like I go to the hospital and I'm seeing these young 22 year old nurses I'm like, man, you're just like a little baby. You know, I mean, you, you can't help but think that. And I said, but I remember 22. And it's not that long ago, but you, you tend to, you don't really look at yourself as getting older. So you don't really pay attention to that. At 37, I wouldn't have. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I wouldn't have. I know I wouldn't have. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know things now, but, you know, and, and you'll see by the average age I'm seeing now is about mid-30s mm-hmm. for heart disease. For heart disease. Yeah. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Do you have any questions for the cardiologists that we have here in the studio today? If you have any questions about what you need to be doing to ensure that you have a healthy heart, give us a call. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So the classic symptoms, let's just list them so that people understand exactly what you should be paying attention to. You uh, want to start, Dr. Yeah, Kibbe? I think anytime you, and I think one of the biggest things is the differences, you know, differences in, in how you normally feel. I mean, I think that's the first step because you have to say to yourself, okay, normally I'm able to do these activities um, and now all of a sudden I can't. And this was a sudden change. Most of the time it's not that subtle. You know, it's normally you'll say, okay, a week ago I could do, you know, a whole bunch of things and now I can't, you know. And I think that's the first step because it's your miss of fatigue. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. issue. You'll see where you know you say, man, I say I, I could take this mile run, and now I feel like I'm, I'm like I, I feel like I'm totally exhausted doing that because that's what's happening is that obstruction mm-hmm. is causing um, your inability to produce that amount of cardiac output that you need to do that level of work you were doing, mm-hmm. and now it's not happening mm-hmm. and you're you're trying to push yourself because you know that's what you normally, normally could do, do. Mm-hmm. And, and that's to me is like the first thing the, the okay. chest discomfort stuff kind of comes down the road but the first thing is a change in exercise tolerance i found that it's like the first classic thing mm-hmm. now suppose you don't exercise well, so you don't know what your well, exercise well, see, tolerance but the thing is. is with that though i mean i'm talking about those where you you those people that used to do that i mean okay. that the bottom okay. the problem we run into is uh, somebody somebody cut in my office with shortness of breath and they'll say, uh, you know, Doc, I, you know, I tried to do this mile run and I just couldn't even walk out, you know, getting get out of the house. And you look at him, I say, well, dude, you know, you, you, you are a little heavy there. And, and you, you know, you haven't. Uh, when's the last time you actually exercised? Well, let's see. What's this? This is nineteen. What's this? Two thousand and thirteen. Well, I think it was like nineteen eighty-two. <laughs> yeah, that would I be mean, a you problem. Know, you yeah. you kind of say, well, well, you know, something. Maybe you did too much starting off, and maybe you need to grade grade it and do walk. I mean, people I found is like they'll do. I forget some of the names of these terms of these uh, these exercise programs, but they'll try mm-hmm. to go from doing nothing to like to, this major mm-hmm. you know exercise program in a day mm-hmm. without no warm up, no nothing. And I'm like, well, that circumstance. And normally that's where we drew. That's what I was talking about drilling to the details. That's my job is to drill into those details because I don't want people thinking just because they are short of breath that they're, that doesn't necessarily yeah, that just means doesn't necessarily that they're having a heart attack. That's where mm-hmm. you start having the edu- that's where the education piece comes in. Okay. Okay. Um, trying to read the name. I'm sure is it Yashika? Yes, that's correct. Hi, it's Yashika. She's calling from Virginia Beach. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. How good. are you? Okay. What's your question? So my question is, even at rest, I've noticed from time to time, I'll have, like, the extra beats in my heart. It is feel like it's, I don't want to say quiver, but it, it makes me think that it's beating twice as fast in the same moment of time. Mm-hmm. And I want, wanted to know, if that's, is that something that's caused for concern? Typically not. Um, I think what you have to, the first step is understanding your other medical problems. Because that's really what it really boils down to with any symptom is, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have diabetes? Do you have uh, like lung disease, like asthma, bronchitis? You'll find that those types of associated illnesses are more apt to cause those extra beats. Typically what they are, and more than not, are something called premature atrial or premature ventricular complexes. And that just means that you're either getting an early beat in the top chamber of your heart, which is a, is a PAC or premature atrial complex, or you're getting early beats in the bottom chamber. Now, they're very common. I mean, very, very common. Uh, and the majority of the time, and I would say even 99.9% of the time, they'll never lead to anything dangerous. But you know, again, I, I try to ask patients: don't make that determination on your own. You know, um, go get it. Go checked get out. it checked out just to make sure. Okay, um, we are about to go back to Pledge Central in uh, just a moment or two, so I don't want to take another call at this point. But I think I will kick it over to Pledge Central a little bit early, so that we can find out how we're doing in terms of raising some money for another view. And Sandra Woodward yes. and Dan Colley are there. How are we doing, guys? We're doing great, Barbara. Thank you. When we've actually raised twenty four thousand six hundred forty two dollars so far yay, today, yay. the Pledge Excellent. Express is uh, just uh, chugging down the road there or chugging down the track the tracks <laughs> tracks yes the tracks so a uh, great show you got there barbara uh just a uh, really in- great information uh that uh it would be uh tough to get without actually going somewhere and, and 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 i've learned a lot of this because i know someone who actually went through cardiovascular disease and so i've heard of a lot of this before but i uh, tell you what the, what the doctor's saying they're so true get it checked out get it checked absolutely out. get it checked out and those who call in right now please let the uh, uh volunteers know that you're listening to another view absolutely. and that you appreciate another view and um, and let's get those calls in. 757-889-9476 is the number to call and say yes. I love this kind of programming. I love the information that Barbara Hamley brings me every Friday at noon and I want to help pay for it because that's what you're doing when you become a member of public broadcasting. When you become a member of your local radio station, WHRV, you are supporting local programming such as Another View. I'm Sandra Woodward. Dan Cauley is with me, great friend of the radio station. Dan, thanks for coming in. Well, it's always a pleasure. As I've said before, I'm 
a member. I'm a volunteer. I'm here because I care about the programming. I care about the information that Barbara is bringing us today. Um, you know, aside from the fact that as a hypochondriac by nature, I'm pretty sure I have, I'm getting the <laughs> symptoms right now. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk to the doctor in the hallway after we're done here. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is your chance for a public radio wellness check. This is your checkup. This is your chance to call in and say, how are you doing? And here's my credit card number, 889-9476. You can put it on a credit card. You can make a pledge. You can point, click, and pledge. We talked earlier, like Beyonce would say, if you like it, then you got to put a ding on it. So point, click, and pledge. We'll hear the ding. We'll know it's there. Uh, but the important thing is to let us know you're there, that you're well, and that you appreciate this programming. Because we can't keep Barbara on the air and this great information on the air without being a member like I am. Seven five seven eight eight nine nine four seven six. Join Dan. Become a member. Maybe it's time to renew your membership. Whichever way, we have some great volunteers here that are, are taking your calls and hooking you up with membership. Whether it's at what I like to call the starter level, Dan, forty eight bucks, or some other level out there in the Ethernet. Uh, it could be twelve hundred, fifteen hundred, twelve hundred is good too. <laughs> That's right. Any amount that works for you, we've got something that meets your budget. Seven five seven eight eight nine nine four seven six. Renew that membership or become a brand new member today. Uh, I'm trying to see if I've got any new. Uh, I I got a you got new a new member one? right here, All right, go for uh, it. Judy Steffens from Hampton, WHRV, and she's doing this for her daughters, who I assume she doesn't think of as pets, but she also has cats, Angel Butters and Soxky. Soxy. Soxy? Sure. She got all Soxy. of them. She got a pair of Soxy. <laughs> and, and there's someone calling because they love cats or dogs, and we'll find out in just a minute. Somebody even called for a red knot shorebird. Our first shorebird. I what think in all the pet shorebird. pledges I've done, that's the first shorebird we've ever gotten. Pet so. Pledge Friday. I love Pet Pledge Friday because all day it's puns and it's pets and it's and pledges. And really bad jokes. Thank you very much. 757-889-9476. That no way was that referring to you, Dan. We have three minutes. We need eight more calls because we've got to get on the road so we can end this Pet Pledge Express this one we should express today. So call and support this great local programming, 889-9476. You know who did it renewed? Carol Meyer from Williamsburg. Thank you, Carol. Uh, she listens to WHRV, and she loves Pet Pledge Friday, and she wanted to thank Berkeley, her hound dog, and she wanted to do it in memory of Tess. Very nice. People love their pets. I love my, I have, I have two cats at home. I love my cats. I love my, my rabbit, and I haven't heard from any rabbits today. I'm very upset no about that. Rabbits. No bunnies. Where are the bunnies? I'm convinced that if we can just just get two people to call in for their rabbits, then we'll have a bunch of rabbits. 889 like Take back what I said about the bad jokes. Alan Hartman is a brand new member from Newport News. He says he loves the local talk. Thank you, Alan. You're a brand new Thank member. Thank you, Alan. I guarantee you that after you listen as a member, you'll hear with a different ear, and I bet you'll be back as a renewing member like Lee Hogan of Williamsburg says uh, loves everything that we do here at WHRV and renewed his membership. Thank you very much. 757-889-9476 is how you two can join Alan as a new member or perhaps renew your membership like Lee did from Williamsburg. Like Bonnie Huff did from Virginia Beach for her dogs, Billy and Lily, and her cat, Bobcat. That's a great That's name for a cat. A good Bob the cat. Bobcat. Uh, Stephen and Violet King of Hampton, renewing members, called on behalf of Peanut, who is the very best dog he could be. Good job, Peanut. Glad to hear it. Uh, another renewing member, Ashley and Mark Grithis. Gristis. I'm sorry, I probably just butchered that, Ashley and Mark. Uh, from Virginia Beach, Piper, Smokey, Dodger, McGruff, and Stray Cat. That's Thank the you cat's for that. name, Stray, Stray Cat. Cat. I love that. That's great. I love the creativity people have when they come up with That's names. That's the best part of that pet cats. pledge. Absolutely. Give us a call. Let us know your pet's name. Let us know the pet you want to have, but let us know that you support this great programming. 889 9476. You know, as a new member, Kimberly Burgess from Virginia Beach. Happy birthday to our anonymous new sustaining partner. I don't know what that means. Oh, sustaining. Actually, I'll mention that. Sustaining member is someone who gives us their credit card and we take a certain amount of money out every month indefinitely or until you call us and say stop. That's what sustaining member is. Well, I like that plan. Pretty cool. It's actually a really cool plan because then you don't have to worry about it. 757-889-9476. We're getting ready to take you back to what it is you're paying for. Great local programming here on WHRV. You can invest in this. You can invest in another view by making a pledge right now. 757-889-9476. The number to call on Pet Pledge Friday, the last hours of our Pledge Express. Let us hear from you. You can also point, click, and pledge online at whrv.org. However you do it, let us hear from you. And thank you. Back to you, Barbara. Thank you so much, Sandra and Dan. We appreciate that, and we hope everyone is calling in. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Dr. Keith Newby. It is another view on health, and he is a cardiologist here in the area. And we're also talking with Gail Alexander Wright and hearing about her story. We're talking about women and heart disease today. 
Gail, you found out after you had your heart attack that your family, you had a family history yes. of heart disease. Did you, you didn't know that ahead of time? This is where I have to be honest. Um, and I, when I go out and speak, I try to really bring this home. In the African-American community, um, there's times when the mother and the father don't stay together. And then if the child stays with the mother for whatever reason, they lose contact with that father's side of family. So mm -hmm. that's what that was my story. My parents divorced when I was eight years old. And not that I knew. I know now at the age of 29, my dad had a heart attack. So I was nine years old. Oh. Didn't know that until the night of the heart attack when the doctors were trying to put the piece of the puzzle together. I didn't have cholesterol issues, no hypertension, none of that. So mm -hmm. they were trying to put this piece of this puzzle together. And that's when I found out, I was like out of a soap opera, mm -hmm. that my father and all of his siblings had had heart attacks at relatively very young ages. So it really yeah. is very, very critical that we talk as a family on, on all sides of the family about the various diseases that people have, Dr. Newby. Yeah, that, um, make, that makes a difference in terms of your diagnosis and treatment also? Yeah, well, I think that in the end, you know, you treat I mean, the family history is important to me in terms of the um, uh, putting a puzzle together. But, you know, in the end, I'm kind of like a person comes in with discomfort. I'm going to treat them as if. It's always safer to me to treat as if they have a heart problem. And then if you find that they don't, then great, you know. But with the, the thing you don't want to get caught in is that fear of, you know, saying, okay, like you get a, that 25 year old person I talked to you about earlier where you just blow it off because you say, ah, you know, they don't have heart problems, they're too young. And then you just go on and you don't really take those extra steps. I always say just take them regardless. It's always safer to take that extra step because it's really not a lot of time effort involved, making sure you look at that EKG, make sure you, you talk to them, get the idea of what their symptoms are. What what happens, I think, is the family history gives you that extra something as you're doing your initial assessment. Say the person doesn't have a heart attack, because if they have a heart attack, you don't care anything other than getting other that vessel open. Get them straight, right? But mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have somebody comes to the emergency room and they have a chest discomfort, the first thing you want to do is say, what's the likelihood? Because in, in cardiology, a lot of it is, is uh, predictive value. Uh, you want to find, okay, what's the likelihood this person actually has heart disease? Because you don't want to do heart catheters on everybody, um, you know, for 8 million different reasons. Your risk, you know, uh, is involved, I mean, even though it's not high risk, but there is some risk involved. So you do want to make sure that you're appropriately looking at each one as an individual. But I look at that as just a piece of that big puzzle. If, mm -hmm. if somebody says, okay, you know, the, if I, my father had a heart attack at 29, you know, and I'm going I'm to pay a lot of attention to that individual as I'm thinking, do they actually have a heart problem? Mm -hmm. Versus if they said, okay, you know, they have no high blood pressure, they have no diabetes, no, the cholesterol is like 100, you know, they, uh, they don't smoke, you know, they're as thin as a rail. And there's no family history anywhere of anything, and everybody lives to be 110. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that kind of person, the, it's, it's the, the predictive value is less likely that they actually have a heart problem. But all of those things that you mentioned, um, diabetes, mm -hmm. smoking, um, uh, being overweight, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, they all can contribute mm -hmm. To heart disease, oh, and if you no have question. one of those symptoms, are you you're just that much more likely yeah. to face heart disease? That, that's that's the reason why we push the envelope of the. Um, um, you know, prevention. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I'm a big prevention kind of guy. I mean, I don't want to wait till after the heart attack occurs. I want to prevent the heart attack from occurring in the first place. Because once you have damage, you know, it's just a blessing whether or not you actually a survived it and b did you get it, escape it without any damage at all. Because the weaker the heart is, the higher the risk of sudden death and other bad things happening. Uh, heart failure, you know, all these other things. And, uh, you know, you, so you want to actually prevent the problem. The problem I'm having, especially in our in our community, is that these chronic illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, you don't typically feel them. You know, diabetic, a lot of diabetics, you know, they don't even know they're diabetic. or they do, but they kind of say, okay, I can... You know, take this medicine, and which I don't want to take anyway, or I can go to Bush Gardens. You know, and and they look at. I mean, it, it becomes as, as simplified as it sounds. You know, or they say, you know, I, I know I don't want that fried chicken, but it looks so good. And they tell me I'm diabetic, but I really don't feel that way. So they can justify in their mind taking this particular approach because they generally don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish I could give people a shot that if they have high blood pressure and pressure goes above a certain level, they feel they, bad. They feel something. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> then you know they'll do something. Because people, you think about it. If you have an infection or abscess, 
and you hurt, you don't want to feel better. Right. Whatever they give you, I guarantee you, you will take because you want to feel better. So the, the problem is when you talk about these kind of illnesses, you know, you can't. So you, people say, well, why am I taking this medicine? I feel good. So they don't. It's hard for them to conceptualize this concept of even though I feel good, there's a problem. Mm-hmm. And I have to address this problem. Otherwise, this may happen down the road. Because we always we play the odds. That's why people gamble because they play the odds and they say, "Okay, am I, I'm just going to take the risk." And do you think women, Gail, especially because we've got so many responsibilities and we tend to not take care of our own health as much as we should, um, that's yet another reason why we kind of put off either paying attention to the other diseases or the other symptoms that could lead to heart disease. Yes, that's exactly what it is. We put everybody, as women, we put everybody before our own uh, lives or health. Mm-hmm. You're exactly right. We have a um, question. A couple people called in. They didn't want to go on the radio, but they left their questions. Um, one, Dr. Newby wants to know, what does it mean to be rheumatic? Am I saying is that? It rheumatic? Rheumatic. Okay. Well, I'm assuming what the question is, <clears throat> the um, rheumatic fever okay. is a um, rheumatic. Yeah, is a uh, infection that a lot of people get. It's a streptococcal infection, and you can get that through either gum infection or other types of uh, infections that can. Uh, unfortunately, so it's not the infection that causes the problem; it's a byproduct of that infection. When uh, antibodies fight. Some of those infections, the um, antibodies can actually attack the heart tissue, oh, and okay. you can have somebody can develop um, damage to the heart valve, and that can lead to either leakiness or stenotic valves, or you know where they're blocked up, and that can mm-hmm. lead to some major problems. What what does what is a um, what does a heart um, a heart an aspirin regimen do? Okay. in order to, to help prevent heart okay. disease. When we or mentioned <laughs> earlier about um, that plaque, uh, right. a soft plaque, right. when, if you think about what happens in any injury uh, that causes loss of blood, um, the body has to clot that off in order to uh, stop the bleeding from occurring. And, you know, mm-hmm. The body is actually very, very smart in its uh, ability to uh, understand what needs to be done. So if you uh, cut somebody, or if they injure themselves, um, as the blood blood comes out, the clot mechanisms kick in. Platelets stick to um, this area. What mm-hmm. aspirin does is it actually keeps those platelets from clumping together. So what happens is you may get the clot mechanisms occurring, but the ad, the the platelets aren't contributing that much to that clot formation. So what happens is the blood will freely flow a so little bit more. So it'll flow better, exactly. better going through. And that's what keeps the heart attacks from happening. Okay. Kathleen joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Kathleen. You're on the air. Hello. How are you all this today? Uh, okay. How are you? I'm great. And Good. thank you for um, being here, Dr. Newby. We're the wonderful source of information for a lot of people. Well, thank you very much. Great. What's your question? Uh, mm-hmm. My question is, um, I'm a 51-year-old woman, and I used to run maybe about three years ago. I kind of stacked off. Now I do walk a lot, carry heavy things a lot. Um, and every once in a while I have this pain, and I have to stop it. It, it just... It's in my heart area, and I have to stop if I'm walking or power walking or something, and it goes away. But my question is, um, is that pre-angina? Does it sound like? I know you can't diagnose over the phone, but does that sound something that should be concerned about? Was that? I thought, well, let me ask you this: Is it? Are you finding this happen when you're carrying something, or just just your power walking? Period. You'll get this. Um, well, when I'm um, carrying something heavy and walking fast, uh-huh. yes. Okay, but not if you're just walking in general. Not if I'm just walking in general. Okay, uh, um, I, I mean it, it's always possible. And you said how how old are you? Sixty-one. Sixty-one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think any um, scenario that there's a question mark, you know, to me should evoke a quick checkup. And and the, and there are simple ways of doing that that don't take a whole lot of your time or. It could be very painless because I know that's the other thing. People don't want to get checked out because they think something's going to hurt. And you can actually do um, easy tests um, for you that would give you that the answer to that question. I mean, my personal opinion, I would get that checked out. Um, I, I, and it's not to worry you because it may be absolutely nothing. But I think it's always safer to uh, go ahead and, and have that evaluated just to make sure that you're okay versus uh, assuming you're okay and then something happened in the future. So I, I would say get that checked out. Thanks a lot, Kathleen, for your call. So, Dr. Nimby, if we go get it checked out, do we have to go to a cardiologist? Can we get our 
primary care person and what does getting it checked out mean? What are you going to do that that walk and stress mm-hmm. test thing? Or? Typically, yeah, typically <laughs> when the first thing is, of course, is a, is a evaluation. That means mm-hmm. uh, a history and a physical. And, you know, I know we're in this technology age and we kind of bypass some of those basic things. But I still think that is the first step is to see, OK, what's the likelihood? You know, because if somebody has very classic angio symptoms that are progressing, you know, to be honest with you, I'm going to bypass the stress test. I'm going to go straight to a heart cath. If, if they're if it's classic and it's progressing, and they have risk factors and other things associated, you know, because the reason why I say that is because if I, I, I you always ask yourself if I do a test, and stress tests aren't 100 percent. They're good tests, but they're not 100 percent. You can miss some things. So I always ask myself, if I do a test on somebody, will I believe the results? You know, will I feel comfortable in those results? Mm-hmm. If I have a modest suspicion, not a high, but a modest suspicion, stress test is indicated. And I'll go with that first. And that's just a treadmill exercise test. And you're taxing the heart to see if you walk a certain distance, will you show signs of uh, angina or uh, some kind of a heart blockage? Mm-hmm. If I do a stress test on somebody and I see a normal result, but I really, in my, in my heart of hearts, I'm like, it's no way this person doesn't have disease. It's classic. It's got everything, you know, that you could look at. They have every risk factor known to mankind. I'm not going to waste time with a stress test because if it's positive, uh, great. I'm still going to a, talk to a person about heart catheter. If it's negative, I'm still going to want to do a heart catheter because I'm like, I don't believe that test result anyway gotcha. because I'm more concerned with what that person told me. Okay. Uh, Jeff joins us from Hampton. Hi, Jeff. You're on the air. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Dr. Newey. How are you? Good, good. I just want to let you know, Barbara, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, uh, the city of Hampton, the College of Pharmacy and the College of Nursing at Hampton University are putting on a free health fair tomorrow from 10 to 2, and it's uh, centered around prescription adherence. And I know that Dr. Newby was talking about some people would rather go to Bush Gardens and you know, buy or take their medication, but it's focused on uh, helping the public understand what it means to adhere to their prescription and take their medication and how important it is. Mm. So they're going to have screenings for high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, all these different things through the, uh, through the college and through the city of Hampton. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's at Hampton University at what time? No, no, no. It's at the West oh. Hampton Community Center. West Hampton Community Center, okay. From 10 to 2, and it's free. Okay. okay. Thanks, Jeff. We appreciate that call. And Dr. Newby, you also have a conference coming up. Yep, yep. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, I'll just be quick about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in, in P. Banking, that gentleman that just called uh, next Saturday, not this Saturday, but March next the Saturday, March, March 2nd. 2nd. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the New Student Union Center, a building at uh, Norfolk State University. We're doing uh, we're kind of a, well, I'm calling it the first annual uh, state health elevation conference. Uh, that's something that uh, I, I did a couple of years ago, kind of a trial run. Um, it wanted to kind of see the interest in what people would they like what we're trying to do. Uh, my, my focus is we talked about here is prevention, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's through education. You know, we want to touch, but taking it to a different level, we want to touch on several things: the physical health, which we we love doing, but social. Mm-hmm psychological, spiritual, and financial well-being because everything impacts. All of it ties All of it together. impacts on, mm-hmm. on health. You know, you think about somebody that's, uh, you know, they're trying to make ends meet. You know, we talked about, I was talking to Terrence Afro Anderson uh, about a couple of weeks ago. I did a show with him. We talked about this broken heart syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and we get these people that have heart attacks with no blockage. You know, a lot of it's because of stress of, of this this type mm-hmm. of thing. So what we wanted to do is I got I always get a group of my doc friends together um, and we volunteer our time. And we do these conferences where we we'll sit down and we we'll do lectures on different topics. So this is at Norfolk State, Norfolk University. State University. It is free and free, open, to, open the to the public. public from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Saturday, March 2nd. And I hope you will come out. I'm serving as MC. Yes, you and, are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, top, I think that would be top, great. The top person. <laughs> <laughs> we do have, we only have about three minutes yeah. left. And Gail, I want to get from you. What would you say to women, particularly African American women, about heart disease? What do you want them most to know? Um, I agree with Dr. Newby that prevention is the key. So you need to educate yourself as much as you can. I do. I am a national spokesperson with the American Heart Association, and it is Heart Prevention Month. So the alternative to not trying to learn about prevention, every 60 seconds, a woman dies of a heart attack, dies, not has a heart attack, but dies. Mm -hmm. So. Not knowing the warning signs or not knowing how to prevent prevent that from happening, you are playing Russian roulette with your life. That could have been my 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. 
So. And what's the uh, website for the GoRedForWomen.org. GoRedForWomen.org. And yes. Gail's story is there. And it is it is very inspiring. And I hope that you all will go. They also have the symptoms. They have all kinds of information on that website. So that's GoRed.org. Gail Alexander Wright, thank you so much for joining us thank on you. Another View. And Dr. Newby, yep. we just get more and more information. Next month, <laughs> we'll come back with another yeah. topic, yeah. right? Yeah, we're going we're to we get live the next time. <laughs> 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 and what's, what is the final word that you want to say? Uh, I just want to say on that health conference we're doing next week, if anybody that's interested, again, it's free and open to the public, you can mm-hmm. register online. And we'd like to at least get some head counts and know who's going to be there. And you can look at the agenda. And that web address is www.vahealthconference.com www.vahealthconference.com Okay, and we'll also have that information on our website, anotherviewradio.org Thank you all so much today for joining me, and we'll be right back Hi, I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed and if you'd like to have another insightful conversation about the African-American community, join us on Another View WHRV 89.5. And welcome back. Boy, we have all kinds of folks listening to Another View. That is a great thing. He's produced over 35 films in his career, and Spike Lee isn't about to slow down. This director, writer, and actor recently released his latest chronicle of life in Brooklyn on DVD. It's called Red Hook Summer. Our Lisa Godley spoke with Spike Lee about his film, his plans for the future, and his desire to help young black males get the education they need. Over the years, Spike Lee has used his position as a filmmaker to examine race relations, historic events, and black culture in general. One of his favorite places to do this is his beloved Brooklyn, which has served as the backdrop for six films. Red Hook Summer is part of my Chronicles of Brooklyn, oh, okay. which is She's Gonna Have It, Do the Right Thing, Clockers, Crooklyn, He Got Game, and now Red Hook Summer. You know, I work here, grew up here. Still very much part of my life, and I don't think that uh, it ended with uh, the last of Brooklyn and Red, Ho- Red Hooks. It won't be the last either. Born Shelton Jackson Lee, Spike captured the attention of the movie industry with his 1986 film, She's Gotta Have It. He shot it in two weeks at a cost of $175,000. The film grossed a whopping $7 million at the box office, making it one of the most profitable films that year. Oh, it was something special. She had this amazing effect on me. Please, baby, please, baby, please, baby, 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 please. Good night. From there, Spike's career took off. Dozens of films and documentaries. His 1990 film, Do the Right Thing, was nominated for an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. Eight years later, he was nominated for an Academy Award for his documentary on the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, titled Four Little Girls. And fans were stunned when Spike's film Malcolm X did not receive a nomination. However, Denzel Washington did receive a Best Actor nomination for his portrayal of Malcolm X in the film, directed by Spike Lee. Oh, I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. Bamboozled. Let us stray. Run on muck. This is what he does. Spike encourages all young filmmakers to pursue their dreams and offers this advice. Right. Really working your writing skills. That's the key. Right. And you don't have to start out writing this great, great screenplay. Just start writing a diary every day. Just write, get, just work in those, those muscles or write every day. Even when you don't feel like it. Hey, it's easy to do something when you feel like it. <laughs> Spike, a Morehouse man with a master's from NYU's film school, says he doesn't like what he sees when it comes to so many young African-American men and their education. It's criminal that more than half of African-American males say they don't graduate high school. We have to turn this number around. There's nothing hip or gangster about being ignorant. 
movement that we had to change around this this value system. And if you look, there's a direct correlation between the dropout rate and the prison population. It's almost like a pipeline. If you drop out, there's a a, a great chance you can end up in the in the penal system. So get your books. Don't let people sway you. Don't let anybody tell you it's uncool or unhip or you're not black if you if you're educated. While the past has been great for Spike Lee, he's definitely looking forward to what the future holds. Well, right now we're working on the Blu-ray DVD, DVD release of my documentary, Bad 25. Uh, that's about the, the making of Michael Jackson's Bad album. Okay. I'm also in post-production on this film called Old Boy, starring Josh Brolin, Lizzie Olsen, and Samuel Jackson, who just finished shooting. So I'm very busy. Go back teaching at NYU in, uh, in the spring. Oh, okay. So things are rolling. Knicks are winning. We're rolling. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. Spike Lee. Boy, you never know who you're going to hear on Another View. You know, normally this is a time when we let you know about interesting events happening around town. But today, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for supporting Another View. When you become a member of WHRV, you provide the support needed to keep Another View and all the other wonderful programs you hear on the air. Now, I'm out in the community a lot, and many of you tell me how much you enjoy the show. Well, the only way we can keep bringing you this program is is with your support. So if you're not a member, now is the time to call 889-9476 or 1-800-940-7170 with your pledge of support. Give generously because you believe in what we do. We really, really appreciate it. Lisa and I say thank you. And I also want to invite you to tune in next Friday for a very special Another View. We will be broadcasting live from Colonial Williamsburg, both on the radio and on the web. I will host a Connect webcast called American Ideas, Steadfast Spirits, where we'll examine how the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution affect African-American women through revolution, reconstruction, and the civil rights era. My guests include Katrina Lewis, who portrays Lydia Brodnax, a formerly enslaved woman who now has her freedom, along with Colonial Williamsburg historians Harvey Bakari and Trisha Brooks. Now, you can listen to the show here on WHRV-FM, or you can watch the webcast at history.org slash connect. It should be a really great show. Um, it'll be something very different for us. And for those of you who have not met me, you'll actually get to see what I look like. How about that? <laughs> That's the difference between television and radio. So join us at the webcast at history.org slash connect. Now, today's show was chock full of critical information that we need to stay healthy. You can hear it again by going to whrv.org, click on listen, and then on podcasts. And you can also find all all of our shows at anotherviewradio.org. And you can also sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming programs that we send directly to your email. So for producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, Danielle Jenkins, who answered the phones, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fabulous weekend. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for Another View. And don't forget, we're still in pledge, so keep Keep those calls coming. 